and welcome to week six of To Dwell in Our Midst, the study of the tabernacle and how it points us to Jesus. And before we jump into anything, I want to open us up in prayer. Father, I just thank you for your word. And God, I thank you for the altar of incense. Lord, I thank you for what it represents in our life. And I just pray that as we study tonight, as we dig deeper, as we um, move through these passages throughout the whole of scripture, Lord, that your truth would rain down, that um, your word would go out um, from your mouth, Lord, and it would fall on us and that it would um, accomplish the purpose with which you have um, purposed for it. Lord, um, that is a promise that you make. And so, Lord, we claim that tonight over this time together, Lord. I just pray that you would give me the words of truth to share, Lord, um, and that it would be um, uplifting, Lord, but it would be what we need to hear, Lord, as we move closer and deeper into relationship and closer to your presence. Um, Lord, this is yours. Um, do with it what you will. And it's your name I pray. Amen. We are moving so, so close to the most holy place, um, to the holy of holies. So um, I always like to start with a, um, a little bit of review um, just to help us remember the lens through which we are studying all of this, because we need to remember the purpose of the tabernacle when we kind of um, zoom in on one particular aspect, it's really easy for us to sometimes get caught up in what this means and then chase it down um, a particular direction. And so I want us to make sure that no matter what we're doing as we discuss the altar of incense, that we are keeping the purpose of the tabernacle at the forefront of our minds. And so we remember that God desires to dwell with his people. And that is a story we see from Genesis to Revelation. And so in the wilderness, he gives Moses plans for a tabernacle. And this is the place where his glory will be able to dwell in the middle of the camp. Um, previous to this, he has dwelt um, in front of them or far off from camp. And they had to stand back um, when God's presence rained down, um, like at Mount Sinai. And so this is God being a way maker and saying, here's how I can relate with you and to you and how you can relate to me. And this is how I can dwell in your midst. And um, as we have moved closer to the core of the um, tabernacle to the Holy of Holies, the more intimate, the more precious. Um, we are in the holy place, and this was the place where only priests could enter. Um, this, uh, many people liken the holy place to represent the secret life or the life, the inner life of a believer. And so we've talked about several pieces of furniture. Um, we're going to go back out to the courtyard and remember on the bronze altar, the blood is spilled and sacrifice is made to atone for the cost um, of sin. And Jesus did this for us, spilling his blood on the cross. Um, then we move to the bronze basin, which reflects the stain of sin, helping the priests know where to wash it off um, to make them clean so that they could enter into the holy place, into that relationship with God. And Jesus does this for us by washing us and cleansing us through the water of the word. Um, as we move into the holy place, the first place would have been on the south side of the tent, and it was the lampstand. It bathed the holy place in light. It stood as a tree of life. It shattered darkness, and it points us to the true light that would one day bring the light of life to all people. Um, and we see that because where God dwells, there is light. And then across to the north side of the holy place was the table of shoe bread. It invites us into this covenant relationship with our creator, God. It is a place of rest and communion as God's holy people. And now we move toward the most holy place, but just outside the altar of incense. Um, turn with me to Exodus 30 verses one through 10. 
You shall make an altar on which to burn incense. You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its breadth. It shall be square and two cubits shall be its height. Its horn shall be of one piece with it. You shall overlay it with pure gold, its top and around its sides and its horns. And you shall make a molding of gold around it. You shall make two golden rings for it under its molding on two opposite sides uh, of it, you shall make them. And they shall be holders for the poles with which to carry. I love that detail in all of these that God continues to be so practical. He's like, listen, we're wandering the wilderness. You're going to need a way to carry this. And so many of these pieces um, have these poles with which them, which with, with which they can carry them around the desert and around the wilderness. Um, you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put it in front of the veil that is above the ark of the testimony in front of the mercy seat that is above the testimony where I will meet with you. And Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. Every morning when he dresses the lamps, he shall burn it. And when Aaron sets up the lamps at twilight, he shall burn it. A regular incense offering before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer unauthorized incense on it or a burnt offering or a grain offering, and you shall not pour a drink offering on it. Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. He shall make atonement for it in the year throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. And then we see in Exodus 37, 25 through 29, the actual construction of um, this. And again, it lines up almost word for word, step by step, um, showing the complete obedience of Bezalel and the artist to make um, this according to the directions that God has given them. So this is the last stop before entering the presence of God. It was as close as the priests could get. So if you'll remember, when God's glory dwelled in the Holy of Holies, only the high priest could enter. And he only entered on the Day of Atonement, which you're going to study next week in our final week of study. Um, so this for a priest and for on most days of the year was as close as one could get to the presence of God. It is one cubit by one cubit. So it's square. And um, two cubits high. So again, a cubit is about 18 inches. So it was a foot and a half by a foot and a half by three feet tall. Um, again, made of acacia wood. We've talked about how that is a lighter wood, but extremely hard and durable. Um, and it's overlaid. Again, we see pure gold, gold that has no impurity in it, no blemish. Um, and we have seen as we have moved closer, as I said, a few minutes ago to the presence of God, um, how his purity, those pieces reflect his purity as well. Everything in the holy place is made with pure materials. Um, and we see a few similarities between the altar of sacrifice, which is in the courtyard. We see the horns made of one piece. We also see that was also square, if you'll remember, um, the rings and the poles with which to carry it. Of course, that one is overlaid with bronze um, because it had the higher melting point and um, needed to be more durable. But also as we move closer to God, again, the materials used become more precious. Um, it also similar to the table had a molding of gold around it. Um, many believe that it would have looked like a crown on top. So let's keep that. Put a pin in that for a few minutes from now. Um, and it was to be placed before the veil. So the veil you're going to study in the coming week as well. But the veil was a massive curtain that divided the Holy of Holies from the holy place. Um, and so this is sitting right at the entrance to the Holy of Holies. Again, it is the closest they can get to the presence of God. And along with these blueprints, the actual design, God gives some, Moses some other specific instructions for its use. Um, it is to be tended and kindled or kindled every morning and every evening 
when the priest tended to the lamps. So part of the priestly duties every morning and every evening when they dressed the lamps was also to kindle the fire um, on the altar on the um, um, altar of incense. Now they would, in order to light the fire, they would, and do this, they would take a coal from the bronze altar and take it in a sensor through all the way to um, that straight line. If you look at your map in your book, a straight line from the bronze altar to the altar of incense. And um, they would use that coal in order to burn the incense. And it is to burn regularly. So this burns at all times. So there is a constant um, smoke that is rising, but it is kindled or it is tended to twice a day. Um, and it was a constant sweet aroma. So before, there's a couple other things I want to talk about, but I want to talk first about the actual incense. So in Exodus 30, um, verses 34 through 38, the Lord said to Moses, take sweet spices, stacta uh, and onicha and galbanum. Don't quote me on the pronunciations of all of those. <laughs> um, sweet spices, pure frankincense of each, sh there shall be an equal part and make an incense blended as by the perf perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy. You shall beat some of it very small and put it before the, uh, the testimony in the tent of meeting where I shall meet with you. And it shall be most holy for you. And the incense that you make shall, you shall make according to its composition. You shall not make it for yourselves. We saw this again with the, the anointing oil. It shall be for you holy to the Lord. So he's saying no one else can make anything like this to use as incense in their house. This is only to be used on the altar of incense. Whoever makes any like it to use this perfume shall be cut off from his people. So we see these um, blend of various spices in, in equal parts. So we have the stacti, which is an aromatic gum, gum resin taken from um, a bush. There's um, onicha or onata. Um, it comes from the shell of a mollusk that is found in the Red Sea. Um, galbanum is a gum resin from a perennial plant that extrudes a milky liquid that resembles tears when it is dried. I thought that was an interesting description. And then we see again, pure frankincense. Um, we've seen this in, previously within, um, on the bread. Um, it is a white gum resin and it was very costly. It actually rivaled gold in its value. And then we see that it is to have salt. Um, and then we see these two descriptors of what the salt does, um, pure and holy. And so this whole thing is pure and holy but it is the salt that is the purifier of it. So um, I'm a little bit of a salt nerd. Um, I think um, I love salt and I love what it does. So salt is actually naturally an antimicrobial. Um, it is impossible for um, most bacteria to live on salt. So it, the way that it works is that salt uses osmosis. So it sucks water um, and moisture out of um, whatever it's touching or whatever it is. And it is um, that moisture is what makes, helps bacteria grow and live. And so if there's no moisture, then it dies and it makes the walls of those um, bacterial cells break down. And so I think it's just so fascinating that God knows this. And that God gave them this way to preserve and to keep the incense pure and holy, that no bacteria could grow in this, no impurity could grow in this incense, but that he gave it away to be pure and holy. And also, if you take this and you go to Matthew 5, where he talks about how we are the salt of the earth. This is just an aside. It actually doesn't have much to do with tonight. But um, when he says that we're salt and light um, in Matthew 5, he's not saying we're the flavor of the earth because we just read what salt does. It makes things pure and holy. Um, it is, dare I say, 
set apart since we were uh, defining that this week as we talked about those definitions again. Um, so when it says that we're the salt of the earth, it's about reflecting God's holiness to the world around us. That's why um, we see it paired with light. Um, and it says in that passage, if salt loses its saltiness, it's not good anymore. If it loses the saltiness, it loses the ability to that to have that process of osmosis to pull the moisture out of the whatever bacteria is trying to grow. And so it becomes pointless and useless. So it's not because it makes everything taste better. It's because it literally purifies and sets apart and makes holy what it touches. Um, and so they would make a larger batch and then the priest um, would um, kindle, use some of it. Um, when he went to kindle the fire, he would add some incense. Um, and then there's also a note about the Day of Atonement. So as I mentioned, we're going to study that in our coming week. Um, but some of the blood from the sin offering on the Day of Atonement, which is also called Yom Kippur, is sprinkled on the horns to make atonement. But then also there is, um, we're going to see in Leviticus 16, that there is extra incense that is used that creates a larger plume of smoke. And that smoke is meant to protect the priest as they enter the Holy of Holies to um, make atonement. So it kind of covers the glory of God so that they are able to safely walk in. Um, and so one final note before moving on, when we read in Exodus 30 verse nine, there is a warning. And this is the only piece of furniture that has a warning against misuse. Um, Exodus 30 verse nine says, they should not offer unauthorized incense on it or a burnt offering or a grain offering or the drink offering. So that should tell us something. And I want us, as we can dig a little deeper tonight, I want us to keep that top of mind. Um, and so like all of the other pieces of furniture, there is a very practical purpose um, for that. Um, we talked about the light how it was a dark room, they needed light. Well, one of the issues, one of the problems with um, the tabernacle is that it would reek because death has a stench. And so burning this sweet aroma would help cover the stench of death. But this also has spiritual representation for us. So as we are looking to, and we've talked about this before, one of the most powerful ways to interpret scripture or to ask the question, what does this mean, is that we use scripture to interpret scripture. And so you all actually got to do that this week as you went to some cross-references. Um, in Psalm 141, one and two, we um, it says, oh Lord, I call upon you, hasten to me, Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Um, Revelation 5, 8 and Revelation 8, 3 through 4 both give us a little bit more blatant explanation of what it is um, where it says that um, the angel took um, the golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And again, we see that in Romans 8, another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. So that is the altar with the, remember I said they would take the golden censer and they would take a coal from um, the bronze altar and bring it to the altar of incense. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. This is a direct reference to the altar of incense, the symbolism of it. Um, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. And so we see that the incense represents prayer. And we actually can see that connection also in Luke 1, 8 through 11. So Zechariah, who is one of the priests, um, and he is the father of John the Baptist. And we see that he was serving as priest. This is verse 8 before God, when his division was on duty, 
according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there um, appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And so we see how at the hour of incense, while Zechariah went in to kindle the, um, the burnt offering, to kindle the fire, um, that there were people outside praying. And so we see this connection between the altar of incense and prayer. So I had you look up some more definitions. So we did some review definitions around atonement and um, purity, but um, I also had you look up some definitions. So prayer by the most simplest of Merriam Webster <laughs> uh, is an address or petition to God. Um, interceding, it is um, a to intervene between two parties with a view to reconcile differences. And an intercessor is one who intercedes, who pray the prayer or petition in favor of another. Um, so we see kind of these working definitions that I want us to kind of keep in the back of our heads as we continue to study. Um, so not only does the incense represent prayer, but the altar itself represents the intercession of Christ. The altar itself is a picture of Jesus. Um, we went back to Hebrews 7, 22 through 28 um, this week, and I want you to listen to the language as I read it and see what sounds familiar. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds the priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Con consequently, he is able to save the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So remember, the whole purpose of the tabernacle is about God's nearness. It's about him dwelling in our midst. And we are able to draw near to God because of Jesus Christ. He lives to make intercession for us. Um, the, the priest made intercession for the people, but Christ makes intercession for us and his intercession is better. And then we read in Romans 8, 31 through 34, what then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Because he is at the right hand of God, interceding for us, there is no condemnation over our lives anymore. Like, y'all... Praise Jesus. I mean, I know we talked about it a great deal at the bronze altar about how thankful we were for the sacrifice and the interceding that Jesus stepped in and he paid the price, but um, he is still seated at the right hand, interceding for us. The Greek word intercession, it comes from a root word that means to hit the mark or to intercept. And so when you think of what Christ did for us, he intersected. I, I almost see it's like we're about to like go down this path toward death and he intersects and blocks us off and takes us with him on a new direction in a new path and in a new way because of his covering. And that is that picture of the crown around the molding, the crown, it's our King Jesus, our great intercessor, who is at the right hand, whose um, prayers for you are an incense that is constantly before the Father. Matthew Henry said, the altar of incense represented the Son of God in his human nature, and the incense burned thereon typified his pleading for his people. 
The continual intercession of Christ was represented by the daily burning of incense thereon morning and evening. Once a year, the blood of the atonement was applied to it, denoting that the intercession of Christ has all its virtue from the sufferings on earth, that we need no other sacrifice or intercessor but Christ alone. He is the perfect intercessor, the one who is without fault, the one that is unchangeable. We should note um, that this is not the altar of sacrifice. This is not where the blood was spilled to, um, to pay the price, to atone for our sins on a daily basis or that that we see, see on the bronze altar. Um, but this altar of incense shows us that we cannot come to God until we have come to Christ. And it is only through Christ that we are able to approach the presence of God. Remember, this stood right in front of the entrance to the Holy of Holies. You could not enter God's presence without the covering of the burning of incense. In the same way, we cannot approach God without the covering of the intercession of Jesus. But we don't only have the intercession of Jesus. It just gets better. I feel like, and wait, there's more. Romans 8, 26 through 28. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know, uh, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart's knows what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all um, know that those who love God, all things work together for good. Those who are called according to his purpose. We have the Holy Spirit in us, searching us and interceding um, on our behalf to the father. He is praying for us in truth in ways that we cannot even understand. The Greek word that for interceding that's used here, it's not the same. Um, it's the similar word, but it has this modifier on it. So there is a prefix that um, of, it's actually pronounced hooper, but it's spelled like hyper. And so it's this idea that he is hyper interceding. That's how I like to say it. It means that he's over and above interceding and it's for our benefit. You know, literally right now, the Holy Spirit is working in you and he is going before the father and he is hyper interceding for you over and above interceding for you for your benefit. Um, and notice the verse that came after that. What is our benefit? that in all things, God works good. I don't believe that means you're going to look back on that situation. that was really hard to work, look, walk through the loss, the pain, um, the suffering and go, man, that was so good. I mean, good God made this horrible situation really good. And I think we need to be careful that we're not, um, that we're not flippantly saying that verse to people walking through some really hard situations. Um, because I don't know that we'll ever look back on the loss in our life and go, man, I'm so glad that happened. That was good that it happened. But here's what I do know. I think that it is possible for us to look back and see the goodness of God, how he walked with us, how he dwelled in our midst, how he did not leave us, how he was in the room waiting for us, where we saw him go before us, where we saw him move and prove his character true. And then we will be more like him because of it. Remember his will for us, First Thessalonians um, tells us that his will for us is our sanctification. It's for us to look more like him and less like ourselves. This verse has been a comfort to me in many situations, even some this past week where I didn't know what to pray. But I remember that the Holy Spirit is not only praying for me, but he's praying for my friends who are walking through hard things. Um, I feel like prayer is one of those things that we're, we have a lot of questions about. Um, I, I hear a lot of women asking questions about how do we pray? Is there a certain form? You know, there's all these acronyms, there's ACTS, there's CATS, 
depending on which one you think should be first. Um, there's, you know, we use the Lord's Prayer as a model. We, um, and, and there's all these questions about, is there a right way to pray? There's a lot of mystery around prayer. Um, and I have to say, honestly, this week kind of added to the mystery of it and, and had me asking some really hard questions. But I think more than anything, what this week's study and what we're about to go into in Leviticus 10 showed me um, that it challenged the way I approach prayer. Um, remember our warning in Exodus 30 verse nine, that you shall not uh, offer unauthorized incense on it or burn an offering or grain offering or drink offering. And then we turn to Leviticus 10 and we see, um, two sons of Aaron. Um, this is Leviticus 10 starting in verse one, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized. Your version may say strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all peoples, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. They were warned not to offer a strange or unauthorized fire on the altar of incense. And God's glory came out from the Holy of Holies and consumed them in an instant because they didn't follow the instructions that he had given them. And when we read passages like this, I think sometimes our tendency as humans is to judge things by our human standards. Because we're like, gosh, they just put the wrong fire on God. Why did you kill them? But we must remember God's character and that he does not have the same standards. But I also feel like we need to flip it. This wasn't necessarily God judging them for disobeying and make his mistake. Those rules were put in place. That warning against misuse was for their protection because they were as close as they could possibly get to the presence of God. And he knew that in his immutable, unchangeable holiness, that if they were that close and they offered something that was unauthorized, if they, if they tampered with what God had said in any way, then they would remove the protection that God had given them. He had given them those rules as, as protection for their life. He gave them a way to approach him, and that is his kindness. And when we step outside of what God has called us to, um, given us to do, when he gives us some very specific guidelines for our lives, and we step outside of those, we remove the protection. We cannot judge the punishment by our own standards, but by God's. Um, and we should not cast aside his instruction. And we read the aftermath in the following verses where um, of how to protect, how the other priests had to protect themselves so as not to also die. Um, and I think this tells us that God is serious about his holiness. Um, and he is, um, and that the way we approach him, he is serious about that. And he is serious about his glory. And that all of that was here for our protection. Um, I spent a great deal of time in preparation for this study reading um, an exposition on the Bible that was written by Alexander McLaren. He was a 19th century minister. And honestly, his writings on this are what challenged me the most. Um, I have several quotes from him, but I'm going to start with this one. He said, our censors are often flaming with strange fire. How much so-called Christians worship glows with self-will or with partisan zeal? When we seek to worship God for what we can get, when we rush into his presence with hot, eager desires, which we have not subordinated to his wills, we are burning strange fire, which he has not commanded. We must be careful that we are not rushing into his presence, that we are not coming to him with our own self-will, that we are not worshiping him for what we can get, 
but that we are approaching him. So this was the other quote, and I'm going to read, um, this is a couple, this is three different excerpts from one thing that Alexander McLaren wrote. And um, I'm going to read them to you because I can't say it any better than what he said. So <laughs> um, we come to this, dear friends, that we fearfully misunderstand and limit the nobleness and the essential character of prayer when, as we are tempted to do by in our inherent self-regard, we make petition its main feature and form. Of course, so long as we are what we shall always be in this world, needy and sinful creatures. So he's saying that we make the essence of our prayers about petition. And, um, and he says, of course, because we are needy, we are in this world. Um, but then he continues, um, and so long as we are what we shall ever be in all worlds, creatures absolutely dependent for life on everything, um, the will and energy of God, petition must be necessarily a very large part of prayer. But this is what challenged me. But the more we grow into his likeness, the more we understand the large privileges and the glorious possibilities which lie in prayer, the more will the relative proportions of its component parts shall be changed and petition will become less and aspiration will become more. The essence of prayer the noblest form of it is thus typified by the cloud of sweet odors that went up before God. The more we spend time with God, the more we are in his presence, our prayers will shift and they will be less about the petition and more about our aspiration toward him. This is um, a little bit later in the same um, section. He says, but when our hearts go out toward him and we are drawn to himself, that is the prayer that befits Christian aspiration. The ascent of the soul toward God is the true essence of prayer. And he describes it as this. He says, let us ask ourselves if our spirits thus aspire and soar, do we know what it is to be, if I may say so, like those captive balloons that are ever yearning upward and stretching to the loftiest point permitted to them by the cord that tethers them to the earth? It's this picture of a balloon that is tied to the earth. We are here. We're not going anywhere until God calls us home. And yet our prayers should be like an aspiration of us just wanting to be closer to him, like that balloon, just trying to get as high as it possibly can. That is what prayer should be for us. Um, it reminded me of this um, song by Cody Carnes. It's called Nothing Else. And he says, I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment and I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything. More than anything that you do, I just want you. It is this idea of just wanting to be at his feet, just wanting his presence. This week really challenged me. I asked myself, am I approaching God in prayer the, priest, the way that the priests would approach the altar of incense? I don't think this means that you can only pray in a closet and, um, you know, I, I think there's, I, I don't even know that there's necessarily a, a form or, a, or that our prayers should take. But, um, and I do believe that like Alexander McLaren said, that we can come to him with our petitions, with our prayers and asking him, but I have to remember his purpose. His purpose is to dwell in our midst. And the reason is because he knows that our very best lies in full surrender to him. He is after my heart, not my comfort. And I should yearn I, um, to be like that balloon stretching toward him, wanting to be more like him. And honestly, when I am um, 
I find myself begging God to move in a situation. Honestly, a lot of times, y'all, it creates a lot of stress in me because I'm like, God, I know you can do this. God, I know you can do this. God, I know you can do this. And sometimes when that's not what his plan is for that moment, it only leads to disappointment and questions. But when I come to him and I'm going, God, this is what I'm asking you to do, but open-handedly here I am because more than anything that you can do, I just want you. And, um, and so this is about drawing near to God and allowing him to draw near to us. Um, and then we see in our homework, um, as we kind of wrap up that we are commanded to pray and, um, it's not just, um, here and there, but we are called to pray unceasingly. We saw multiple places in our passages that led us to this, um, thought of praying at all times. Um, it's similar to meditating on scripture. It's not something we just visit once there's a constancy to it. Um, and so like the incense continues to rise. Our prayers continue to rise, covering the stench of sin and death because we are longing toward him. Um, and I love that as um, our prayers are constantly rising, um, my friend Crystal McCary, who is part of our Bible study, she said this once, and it's just really stuck with me, that there's not an expiration date on our prayers. Um, our prayers are eternal. And God um, just as the incense is always before the Lord, it's perpetual and everlasting. So are our prayers. Um, and this is grace for me in those moments where you're like, I told that person I would pray for them. And then life took over and I prayed for them that one time. I want you to know like that prayer still, it didn't expire. It's not like it ran out that day. And so I want you to know that um, we are called to pray for one another and we are called to intercede um, for one another. Um, but, um, but our prayers don't expire. We read several passages, 1 Timothy 2, um, 1 through 7, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, all of these point to praying at all times, um, especially in that Ephesians 6. We saw how um, praying the word of God that we pray in the spirit and the sword of the spirit is the word of God. Um, there's power in praying God's words back to him. Um, we saw Moses do that a lot in the stories from the wilderness study. He reminds God of his character and he reminds God of his word. And that's not because God forgot. It's Moses kind of um, reassuring himself. When we call God's character out to him, it's a reassurance to us of who he is as well. Um, Oswald Chambers said, and this is um, my final point here. Oswald Chambers said, Chambers said, the essential meaning of prayer is that it nourishes the life of the son of God in me, and it enables him to manifest himself in my mortal flesh. That is the essence of prayer, that, um, that God, that the life of the son of God, that Jesus in me is being nourished and that he is able to manifest himself through me. So these are the questions I'm asking myself. Um, and I challenge you to, am I praying prayers that are nourishing the life of the son of God, of son, the son of God in me, or are my prayers opening the door and are my prayers opening the door for him to manifest himself in my life? Am I praying for my own comfort or am I praying for more of God? Am I praying around the gospel? Am I praying around salvation? Am I praying around sanctification, not just for me, but for the other saints, for the other people in Christ? Am I praying aligned with his word? And y'all, I'll admit, I'm still wrestling through this. Um, there are days when I pray and I go, God, I don't even know if I'm allowed to pray this. But my um, day looks like um, I have just loved falling into this practice of talking to God throughout the day. Um, one of my um, mentors, he was um, a chaplain in the Navy and he said, um, he talked about how you salute your commanding officer in the morning, and then you salute him the last time you're going to see him during the day. But every single time you see him, you're not saluting him. And so I really, um, so like, as you see him throughout the day, you don't have to like salute every time he walks in the room. You just do it the first time you see him in the morning and the last time you see him at night. And I think that's such a picture of what the priest did here on the altar of incense. They kindled the fire in the morning. And they kindled the fire at night, 
but the incense rose all through the day and all through the night. And so we do need these dedicated times where we come to God. But I find myself talking to God while I'm cooking. It's one of my most powerful prayer times. Um, for some people, it might be while they're in the garden or it might be while they're folding laundry. Um, I'm thanking him when something comes to mind. I'm talking to him about what I'm feeling. It's talking, um, apologizing and asking forgiveness when you realize that the words came flying out of your mouth before your heart, before your mind could stop them. It's recognizing his presence in the situation um, and giving credit where credit is due. It's calling out his character. It's proclaiming the truth of who he is when Satan is trying to get you to believe a lie. It's sitting quietly with a song of worship. It is whatever makes you feel like that tethered balloon stretched as far as you can get to heaven, longing for God, not what he can do, but for who he is. To review, on the altar, bronze altar, blood is spilled and the sacrifice is made to atone and cover sins. Jesus did this for us, spilling his blood on the cross. The bronze basin reflects the stain of sin, helping the priests know where to wash it off, making them clean so that they could enter the holy place. Jesus does this for us by the washing of his word. The bronze basin reflects, oh, sorry, the lampstand bathed in the holy place in light. It stood as a tree of life. It shatters darkness and it points us to the true light, Jesus, the light of the world who would one day come to bring the light of life to his people. The table of shoe bread invites us into a covenant relationship with our creator, God. It's a place of rest and communion as God's holy people. And on the altar of incense, holy incense is burned to cover the stench of death. The priests make intercession on behalf of the people. Jesus Christ is the altar that makes intercession for us constantly before the Father, covering the stench of sin so that we may draw near. Prayer is how we draw near to our God. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for making a way. Thank you that we are able to draw near. And Lord, let us never forget the holy reverence with which we should do that. God, that we should long for you, not what you can do. Lord, that we should long to be in your presence, God, because it is in your presence, it is you dwelling in our midst that provides us our very best. Lord, you are intolerant of rivalry. You are jealous for us because you know that your our very best lies in that full surrender to you. And so, Lord, I pray that as we go out, as we um, go through this week, Lord, we would open our hands, Lord, that we would move in trust of you and that we would remember that when we are weak, when we aren't sure what to pray, we can trust that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are interceding on our behalf before you. Thank you for doing that for us. It's in your name, I pray. Amen.